fellow weirdlings, it's Margot, and today I'm bringing you the real-life horror story of the Christmas Eve disappearance of the five Sodder children. If you're ready to ponder a complex and intriguing decades-old mystery, keep watching. This is a fascinating story with so many twists and turns, and every answer brings up even more questions. It's the story of five siblings who are said to have burned up in a fire on Christmas Eve night, but all evidence, or lack thereof, appears to point to the contrary. It's the story of parents and siblings who never gave up hope and did everything in their power to find the missing pieces of their family puzzle. I suppose we should start where the Sauter family began. George Sauter immigrated to the United States from Sardinia in 1908 at the age of 13. His older brother, who had accompanied him to Ellis Island, immediately returned home to Italy, leaving young George to fend for himself. Smart, ambitious, and determined, George soon found work carrying water and supplies to workers on the Pennsylvania railroads. After a few years, he moved to Smithers, West Virginia. There, he worked as a driver until he was able to launch his own trucking company, hauling dirt for construction and later hauling freight and coal. One day, George walked into a local store called The Music Box. There, he met the owner's daughter, Jenny Cipriani, and the two soon fell in love. Jenny was also an Italian immigrant who'd arrived in the U.S. at three years old. George and Jenny got married and had ten children between 1923 and 1943. They made their family's home in Fayetteville, West Virginia. Fayetteville was and is a small Appalachian town. It had an active Italian immigrant community. According to one county magistrate, the Sauters were one of the most respected middle-class families around. George was known to be quite vocal about his strong opinions on everything from current events to politics, but never cared to discuss what had made him want to leave Italy at such a young age. Whatever George had lacked growing up, he seemed to try to give to his kids. George Sauter's children were seemingly well-loved and well-cared for. One thing George did care to talk about was Mussolini, or more specifically, his contempt for the Italian dictator. George was adamantly anti-fascist. This would occasionally put him at odds with other members of the local community, many of whom were also Italian immigrants who disagreed strongly with George's views. In December of 1945, the Sauter family consisted of Father George, Mother Jenny, and their 10 children. John was 23 years old, Joe was 21, Marion was 17, George Jr. was 16, Maurice was 14, Martha was 12, Louis was 9, Jenny was 8, Betty was 5, and baby Sylvia was two years old. With the exception of Joe, who was away serving in the army, the family all lived in their wooden frame seven bedroom house about two miles outside of town. On Christmas Eve of 1945, the Sauter children were allowed to open a few of their Christmas gifts. At bedtime, five of the children, Maurice, Martha, Louis, Jenny, and Betty, asked if they could stay up late to play with their new toys. Their parents agreed and made them promise to lock the front door before going upstairs to bed. At around 12.30 a.m., Jenny was startled awake by the ringing of the telephone and rushed to answer it. She heard an unfamiliar female voice ask for an unfamiliar name with raucous laughter and glasses clinking in the background. When Jenny answered with, you have the wrong number, the voice laughed and hung up. On her way back to bed, Jenny noticed that all of the lights downstairs were still on and the curtains were open. The front door was unlocked. Spotting Marion asleep on the sofa in the living room, she assumed the other kids had gone upstairs to bed. She locked the door, closed the curtains, turned off the lights, and went back to bed. Jenny had just begun to fall back asleep when she heard a sharp, loud bang on the roof, followed by a rolling sound. Still, she fell asleep quickly thereafter. An hour later, she was awoken again, this time realizing the house was full of smoke. Jenny and George managed to escape the inferno with two-year-old Sylvia, whose crib was in their bedroom. They were unable to see much on their way out of the house through the thick smoke and fire. They tried to call the fire department, but the phone wasn't working. Once outside, George did a quick head count of the children. 17-year-old Marion had made it out from the living room. 23-year-old John and 16-year-old George Jr. had managed to escape their shared upstairs bedroom, singeing their hair on the way out. The five children who'd asked to stay up late were unaccounted for. Figuring they were trapped in their two attic bedrooms on either end of the hallway, George broke a window to re-enter the house, slicing a large strip of skin off his arm in the process. 
the downstairs rooms, the living and dining rooms, kitchen, office, and George and Jenny's bedroom were all engulfed in flames, as was the staircase leading to the upstairs bedrooms. George raced back outside hoping to reach his children through the upstairs windows, but he soon realized the ladder he'd always kept propped against the house was nowhere to be found, despite using it the day before. He quickly went on to plan B, thinking he could drive one of his coal trucks up to the house and climb on top of it to reach the windows. But even though the trucks had worked perfectly the day before, neither would start that night. Racking his brain for another option, George, barefoot but unaware of the cold and his determination to reach his children, tried to scoop water from a rain barrel, but found it frozen solid. Five of George's children, Maurice, Martha, Louis, young Jenny, and Betty, were losing what little time they may have had left, and George was helpless to get to them. He didn't even notice that his arm was badly cut and very bloody, or that his throat was raw from screaming their names. While George was frantically trying to get to his children, Marion ran to a neighbor's house to call the Fayetteville Fire Department, but couldn't get any response. A motorist who'd caught sight of the blaze also called the fire department from a nearby tavern, but once again, no response. The exasperated motorist drove into town and tracked down Fire Chief F.J. Morris. Morris initiated the phone tree system, whereby one firefighter phoned another who phoned another, and so on. This was Fayetteville's painfully time-consuming version of a fire alarm. The house was completely burned to the ground 45 minutes after the fire had begun. Though the fire department was only two and a half miles from the Sauter house, firefighters didn't arrive until 8 a.m., six and a half hours after the fire started. This was, in part, due to Fire Chief Morris's inability to drive the fire truck. The fire department was also low on manpower due to the war. It's unclear how much experience the firefighters that remained in the department actually had. One of these firefighters was Jenny's brother. By the time firefighters arrived, all that was left of the Sauter's home, and presumably five of the Sauter children, was a smoking pile of ash. The remaining family members were absolutely devastated, wailing in grief and despair. It was assumed that five of the Sauter children were dead, and it was therefore assumed that five skeletons would be found within the debris, but a brief search of the remaining ash and rubble turned up no trace of human remains. Chief Morris suggested the fire had been hot enough to completely cremate the bodies. The full investigation was postponed until after Christmas. This made the tragic situation even harder on George and Jenny, who were desperately searching for their children's remains. Though Chief Morris instructed George to leave the site undisturbed so the state fire marshal's office could conduct a more thorough investigation, after four days, George and Jenny couldn't stand the sight of it anymore. George buried the basement under five feet of dirt to preserve the site as a memorial. The Sauters planted flowers across the space where their family home had stood. The next day, a coroner's inquest was convened, which determined that the fire had started in one of the basement rooms as a result of faulty wiring. The official conclusion was that the children had died in the house fire, and the deaths were declared accidental. Less than a week after the fire, on December 30th, the coroner issued the five death certificates, attributing the causes of death to fire or suffocation. George and Jenny were too grief-stricken to attend the funeral on January 2nd, 1946, though their surviving children did. But still, the Sauters had begun to wonder if their children were still alive and if the fire hadn't been at all accidental, and for many good reasons. For one thing, it was found that the missing ladder had been thrown in a ditch 75 feet away. For another, a telephone company worker discovered the phone lines had been cut rather than burned through in the fire as they'd originally assumed. Whoever cut them would have had to climb 14 feet up the pole and reach two feet away from it to reach the wire. A neighbor came forward claiming to have seen a man on the solder property around the time of the fire, removing a block and tackle used for removing car engines. George wondered if this had something to do with the reason his trucks had refused to start. George believed that the trucks had been tampered with, However, one of his sons-in-law told the Charleston Gazette Mail in 2013 that he had come to believe that Sauter and his sons might have, in their haste to start the trucks, flooded the engines. The man seen by the neighbor was actually identified and arrested. He admitted to the theft and claimed he had been the one who cut the phone line, thinking it was a power line, but denied having anything to do with the fire.
However, no record identifying the suspect exists, and it's never been explained why he would have wanted to cut any utility lines to the solder house while stealing the block and tackle. In 1968, Jenny said that if he had cut the power line, she, her husband, and their four children would never have been able to make it out of the house. There were also a few other odd events. In the months leading up to the fire, George and Jenny couldn't help but wonder if these strange interactions could have been related to whatever had become of their children. First, a stranger had appeared at the Sauter home in the fall, a few months prior to the fire, asking about hauling work. He had wandered to the back of the house, pointed at the two fuse boxes, and said this is going to cause a fire someday. George found this strange, especially since he'd just had the wiring checked by the electric company, which had determined it to be in good condition. Then an electrician showed up and warned that the faulty fuse boxes could cause a serious fire. George called the electric company, who had just rewired the property and installed a new gas stove. The company reassured him that the wiring was perfectly safe, suggesting that the electrician who claimed it was faulty was probably just looking for extra work. Around the same time, another man tried to sell the family life insurance and became irate when George declined. Your house is going up in smoke, he warned, and your children are going to be destroyed. You're going to be paid for the dirty remarks you've been making about Mussolini. George didn't take the threat seriously. He knew people had been combative about his political beliefs, but it seemed ludicrous that anyone would actually try to harm his family because of them. Strangely, the insurance salesman who had threatened George was actually one of the jurors during the inquest into the fire that had determined it accidental. The older Sauter sons recalled yet another peculiar event involving a stranger. Just before Christmas, they noticed a man parked along US Highway 21 watching the younger kids on their way home from school. He'd seemingly been following them. The Sauters also theorized that if the fire had been electrical due to faulty wiring, as the official report stated, it would have caused the power to go out, yet all of the Christmas lights had remained on throughout the fire's early stages. The driver of a bus that passed through Fayetteville late on Christmas Eve said he'd seen some people throwing balls of fire at the house. A few months later, while the family was visiting the site of the fire, little Sylvia found a small, hard, dark green, rubber ball-like object in the brush nearby. Jenny remembered hearing the thud and rolling sound on the roof just before the fire had started. George inspected the object and concluded it was a napalm pineapple bomb, as are used in warfare. The family later claimed that contrary to the fire marshal's conclusion, the fire had started on the roof, although by then there was no way to prove it. All of these strange occurrences and the lack of any physical evidence that her children were dead prompted Jenny to start her own investigation. For one thing, Jenny couldn't understand how five children could die in a fire and leave no bones or any other remnants of their existence. There had still been remnants of various identifiable household appliances found in the burned out basement. She conducted her own experiment, burning animal bones to see if fire could completely consume them. Each time she was left with a pile of charred bones. A crematorium employee informed her that bones remain after bodies are burned for two hours at 2,000 degrees. The Sauter's house had been destroyed in 45 minutes. More recently, Dr. Ramsey Amri, a researcher at Harvard Medical School, stated bones do not exactly melt. It's more falling apart as they are very solid. For an entire human skeleton to be destroyed in a fire, it would have to burn at more than 850 degrees Fahrenheit consistently for two hours. The Sauter family home was on fire for 45 minutes. Between the wooden frame of the structure and the wind speed that night, the house was gone pretty quickly. So considering how quickly it took the house to burn down, there should, in theory, still have been five skeletons among the debris. Yet there was no trace of any of them. In an interview with the Raleigh Register more than 30 years after the fire, Jenny said, You can't tell me five children could burn up in a little old house like that and something wouldn't be left. No, I'll never believe it. Others strongly believe the fire wasn't an accident as well, and that the Sauter kids may have been kidnapped. There were many theories on what may have happened. One interesting theory is based on the fact that the coal trucking business had been under constant pressure from the Sicilian Mafia in the months leading up to the fire, and George was aware of this. 
Many believe that the strange car that had been following the younger Sauter children on their way home from school shortly before that tragic Christmas may have been connected to their disappearance and to the Mafia. A lot of accounts of the Sauter family story have suggested that the wrong number phone call to the Sauter house an hour before the fire may have somehow been connected to the fire and disappearance of the children. However, investigators later located the woman who had made the call, and she confirmed it had been a wrong number on her part. Over the years following the children's disappearance, the police received many reports of possible sightings. A woman operating a rest stop between Fayetteville and Charleston claimed she saw the children the morning after the fire and served them breakfast. She told the police there was also a car with Florida license plates in the parking lot. After seeing the children's pictures in the newspaper, another witness claimed she'd seen four of them after the fire. The woman ran a hotel in Charleston, 50 miles west of the Sauter home. She thought this may have taken place a week after the fire. In a statement to the police, she said, The children were accompanied by two women and two men, all of Italian extraction. I don't remember the exact date. However, the entire party did register at the hotel and stayed in a large room with several beds. They registered about midnight. I tried to talk to the children in a friendly manner, but the men appeared hostile and refused to allow me to talk to these children. One of the men looked at me in a hostile manner. He turned around and began talking rapidly in Italian. Immediately, the whole party stopped talking to me. I sensed that I was being frozen out, and so I said nothing more. They left early the next morning. Investigators today do not, however, consider her story credible, as she had only first seen photos of the children two years after the fire, five years before she came forward. Another woman claimed to have seen the children looking out the windows from a passing car while the fire was still in progress. These sightings solidified Jenny's conviction that her children had been kidnapped. With seemingly no real help from the local authorities, the Sauters continued with their own investigations. Everyone seemed to have a theory. Even Jenny was considered suspicious in the eyes of the public at one point. In an interview, she revealed, For a while, a rumor was going around that somebody had $75,000 worth of insurance on the children, but we didn't have any insurance. In 1947, George sent a letter to the FBI and received a personal reply from J. Edgar Hoover, stating, Although I would like to be of service, the matter related appears to be of local character and does not come within the investigative jurisdiction of this bureau. He said his agents would, of course, assist if they could get permission from the local authorities. The Fayetteville Police and Fire Departments declined the offer. Next, the Sauters hired a private investigator named C.C. C. Tinsley. This is how they made the discovery that the insurance salesman who had threatened George had been a member of the jury that had deemed the fire accidental. Tinsley also heard a strange story from a Fayetteville minister about the fire chief, F.J. Morris, who had always asserted that no human remains were found in the debris from the fire. According to this minister, Chief Morris had confided that he'd discovered a heart in the ashes. He claimed he'd hidden it inside a dynamite box and buried it at the scene. Tinsley managed to persuade Morris to show the Sauters where he'd buried the box. They dug it up and took it to the local funeral director for examination. He concluded that it was, in actuality, beef liver, miraculously untouched by the fire. Shortly afterward, the Sauters began hearing rumors that the fire chief had told others that the contents of the box hadn't been found in the fire at all. He'd buried the beef liver after the fact in the hope that finding any remains would satisfy the Sauters enough to stop the investigation. Over the next few years, more tips came in, and the Sauters investigated all of them. At one point, George saw a picture in a newspaper of New York City school children, and was certain one of them was his daughter Betty. He drove all the way to Manhattan, but the girl's parents refused to speak to him. In August of 1949, the Sauters decided to re-examine the scene of the fire and persuaded a Washington, D.C. pathologist named Oscar B. Hunter to supervise a new search through the dirt at the house site. Hunter executed a thorough excavation of the debris. He uncovered damaged coins, a partly burned dictionary, and more intriguingly, several shards of vertebrae. Hunter sent the bones to the Smithsonian Institution, which issued the following report. The human bones consist of four lumbar vertebrae belonging to one individual. 
Since the transverse recesses are fused, the age of this individual at death should have been 16 or 17 years. The top limit of age should be about 22, since the centra which normally fuse at 23 are still unfused. On this basis, the bones show greater skeletal maturation than one would expect for a 14-year-old boy, the oldest missing solder child. It is, however, possible, although not probable, for a boy 14 and a half years old to show 16 to 17 maturation. The report also stated that the vertebrae showed no evidence of being exposed to fire and noted, it is very strange that no other bones were found in the allegedly careful excavation of the basement of the house. Noting that the house reportedly burned for only about half an hour or so, it said that one would expect to find the full skeletons of the five children rather than only four vertebrae. The report concluded that the bones were most likely in the supply of dirt George used to fill the basement to create the memorial for his children. This report from the Smithsonian and the national attention it attracted prompted two hearings at the Capitol in Charleston. Afterward, Governor Oki L. Patterson and State Police Superintendent W. E. Burchett declared the case closed, telling the Sodders that their search was hopeless. The FBI decided it had jurisdiction as a possible interstate kidnapping, but dropped the case after two years of following fruitless leads. The Sodders' response to the end of official efforts to resolve the case was to pay for a giant billboard along State Route 16 and another at the site of the fire in 1952 that read, what was the fate of our children? Kidnapped, murdered, or burned? They offered a reward of $5,000, the equivalent of approximately $217,000 today, for any helpful information, and distributed flyers saying the same. They soon increased the amount to $10,000. A letter arrived from a woman in St. Louis saying the oldest girl, Martha, was in a convent there. Another tip came in from Texas claiming a bar patron had overheard an incriminating conversation about a Christmas Eve fire in West Virginia that had happened years earlier. A tipster in Florida claimed the children were staying with a distant relative of Jenny's. When it was found that the relative had children that looked similar to George and Jenny's children, he had to prove the children were his own before George was satisfied. In 1967, George went to the Houston area to investigate another tip. A woman there had written to the family saying that Lewis had revealed his true identity to her one night after having too much to drink. She believed that he and Maurice were both living in Texas somewhere. However, George and his son-in-law, Grover Paxton, were unable to speak with her. Police there were able to help them find the two men she had indicated, but they denied being the missing sons. Paxton said years later that doubts about that denial lingered in George's mind for the rest of his life. George traveled the country investigating every lead. He always returned home without his children or any answers. In 1968, more than 20 years after the fire, Jenny received a letter addressed only to her. It was postmarked from Central City, Kentucky with no return address. Inside was a photo of a man in his mid-twenties. On the back was handwritten, Louis Sauter, I love Brother Frankie, I little boys, A90132 or 35. The young man bore a strong resemblance to Louis Sauter, who had been nine at the time of the fire. They had the same dark curly hair, dark brown eyes, straight, strong nose, and the same upward tilt of the left eyebrow. The Sauters hired another private detective and sent him to Kentucky. They never heard from him again. George and Jenny feared that publishing the letter or name of the town on the postmark might put their son in danger, so instead they added the updated image of Louis to their billboard and hung an enlarged version over the fireplace. It gave them renewed hope that their kids may be alive and well, somewhere. In an interview given around this time, George said, Time is running out for us, but we only want to know if they did die in the fire, we want to be convinced. Otherwise, we want to know what happened to them. George Sauter died a year later in 1969, still seeking answers. After George's death, Jenny built a fence around her property and began adding rooms to her home, putting layer after layer of walls between herself and the outside. Since the night of the fire, she'd worn black exclusively in perpetual mourning. She did so and carefully tended the children's memorial garden until her own death in 1989. Though mourning their loss, she never stopped searching for her lost children or believing that they were still alive. It was only upon her death that the nearly four decades old weather-worn billboard finally came down.
but the remaining sought her children and grandchildren, excluding John, who never talked about the night of the fire except to say that the family should accept it and get on with their lives, continued the investigation. Many of them came up with theories of their own. The local mafia had tried to recruit George, and he'd declined. They tried to extort money from him, and he'd refused. The children were kidnapped by someone they knew, who'd come in through the unlocked front door, told them there was a fire, and offered to take them to safety. They may not have survived the night. If they had survived, and had lived for decades, if it really was Lewis in that photograph, they'd failed to contact their parents only because they wanted to protect them. Sylvia Sauter Paxton, the youngest of the family and last surviving Sauter child, died earlier this year in 2021. The fire was Sylvia's earliest memory. She was the last of the kids to leave home and would often stay up late with her father, mulling over what might have happened. She said in an interview in 2013, I experienced their grief for a long time. She never forgot the sight of her father bleeding or the terrible symphony of everyone's screams and she never got any answers as to why it happened. Sylvia believed that her siblings survived that night. She assisted in efforts to find them and publicize the case. She'd often visit sleuthing websites and engage with people who were still interested in her family's mystery. Sylvia's daughter said in 2006, she promised my grandparents she wouldn't let the story die, that she would do everything she could. Many believe the Sauter children did die in that long ago Christmas Eve fire. In fact, it's said that in John's original account of the events of that evening, he claimed he'd physically tried to awaken the children before fleeing the house. Of course, like so many aspects of this case, nobody really knows if this is true. John was the one solder child who refused to talk about the fire after the fact. For what it's worth, I believe the suffering and mental anguish this family went through was entirely real, and they wanted their story heard. So it won't hurt for us to keep telling it and remembering their lost children and pondering what may have happened on that horrible Christmas Eve. That's all I have for you today. I hope you've enjoyed this story and will come back for more. Like, subscribe, leave a comment, and bring your friends, family, COVID pod, cult members, invisible friends, or enemies. And if you have any thoughts on what may have become of the Sauter children, leave them in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching.